just that. You want to be scared? Come with me. You will experience tales of horror, ghosts, and death. It is not recommended for the weak at heart. Listeners in the dark, it's more fun that way. This is Weekly Spooky. <laughs> hey, my friends, Henry Kuto here, and of course, welcome to our final show of the year. Um, we've only been doing Weekly Spooky since October of 2019, and we've already had nine great episodes, and this is the tenth one. And I'm very excited because something I wanted to bring about with Weekly Spooky is seasonal uh, scary stories. So tonight we've got one just for New Year's Eve, because I want to mention real quick, New Year's Eve, I like reflecting, I like looking back at the year that we've had and, and the times we've had, but it's not really a holiday for me. Um, I'm not a drinker, I'm not a partier, so it's always kind of been for other people. But I usually try to find a way to enjoy the holiday on my own, in my own way, you know, a movie marathon, drinking some sparkling cider, which to be honest, as I get older, uh, is becoming too sweet for me. I hate to <laughs> I hate to say it. I used to drink an entire bottle of it by myself, and now I'm lucky if I could finish a glass. But I do like staying up till midnight and counting down. It's a tradition I don't intend to break. So before I talk a little bit more about the story, I do want to say thank you so much to those who have been listening. Uh, the show has been growing every single episode, and it means the world to me. One of my favorite things about this year has been doing this show. So, But I'll talk about that more after the story, because speaking of finding your own way to celebrate, the main character in our story tonight, well, he has his own very special way of celebrating the beginning of every year. And uh, it doesn't involve uh, sweet snacks and, uh, and countdowns. It's a little bit more devious. This is a little uh, weekly spooky original, a special one written by our very own producer, Dan Wilder. And I am so excited to present it to you. And I must say, it is a nasty little piece of work. So enjoy the story. And afterward, I'll be around to jaw at you a little bit. But for now, let's listen. Even the devil tells the truth, sometimes, by Dan Wilder, a weekly spooky original. The first couple of years, I just went for hookers. I figured no one would go looking for those broads anytime soon. It was simple. While everyone was staring at that big stupid ball like a bunch of deer in headlights, I'd find my gal taking her down an alley and doing them up proper. A happy New Year's for me. In theory, anyway. The problem is, those bitches looked like they were relieved. And why wouldn't they be? The knife was just another long, hard object painfully crammed inside them. But this one brought an end to their filthy existence. Christ, it was so hard to get excited over that work, but, uh... But I did my best. Damn, I've... I've gotten ahead of myself again. I suppose you want to know what makes me tick, huh? Well, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Just messing with you. What do you want to know? Um, my parents were real pieces of work. My dad drank his life away in every pisshole bar down by the docks, and my mom sold ass in the same. I was unplanned, unwanted, and never made to forget it. Except, none of that hard luck garbage is true. I grew up in a nice suburb. Mom was a teacher and homemaker. Dad was an accountant. The biggest threat to my childhood was the fact that I was spoiled rotten. Or, as spoiled as a middle class brat can be. So, what made me turn bad? I have no idea. See... Back around 76 or so, beating the shit out of strangers for no reason was how I got my kicks. But little did I know, this was going to be the mozzarella stick platter before the eggplant parm that is my career these days. Let me tell you. 
Anyway, I'd uh, pulped this cat down Chinatown Way, Dig, uh, looking for any ill-gotten gains I could grab. I found some sort of amulet in his left pocket. Older than my Aunt Petunia and expensive, too. At least I hoped it would be uh, when I went to pawn it. But that would have to wait, though, because beating the shit out of a man is hungry work in my stomach. It was growling something fierce. Thirty minutes later, I was kicked back in my easy chair in my rat trap of an apartment, hamburger grease mixed with thin blood from that rare patty dripping down my arm. That's when I remembered my spoils. I reached into my pants pocket and brought out that glittering trinket, now covered with slop from my chow. That's when that bauble went shiny and hit me with some sort of mumbo-jumbo magic that sent me sprawling across the floor. Things went black for a hot second, but when I came to, he was just sitting there on top of the giant zenith. Well, I say he, but in truth it may have been a she, or a human-shaped lump of clam dip, because no matter how hard I stared at this thing, I could never get a clear look at it. But I could tell it was dressed to the nines, and always smiling. What's so funny, pal? I asked. That's when the fucker talked directly to my brain. And while I can tell you what it said wasn't in any language I'd ever heard, I understood every damn word. The bit about immortality, the murder biz that would seal the bargain, one ex-woman every midnight on New Year's Eve. Hell, the son of a bitch even had a big contract for me to sign, like something out of a goddamn comic book. And naturally, that pen was filled, you guessed it, with blood. Too much, right? So, yada yada, Lucifer, hookers, and blood. And here we are, New Year's Eve, 1979. And it's time for a change. But since not a lot of you clowns are familiar with my work... Let me take you through my 9 to 5 if you can pick up what I'm laying down. I wake up around noonish. See, uh, I set my own hours so I can sleep in. A real job perk, if you ask me. So yeah, uh, shit, shower, shave, fry up an egg, maybe two for breakfast, orange juice and vodka. Then, on with the day's business. I cruise the streets, and it is cold as a witch's tit out here. But this involves my work uh, the 364 days it isn't December 31st. I just kind of walk around with a heart on and get as much attention from the leather boys and hustlers as I can, marking in my mind who is where and when. See, the devil is in the details. Then I take in a porno flick or two, grab a dog or a slice, then make my way back through the spank bank of earlier. I go for the toughest, strongest looking laddie I can find. Then I punch and kick the ever-loving shit out of them. Rob them, and maybe do the same to any tourist unfortunate enough to cross my path. And then it's off for a cup of joe. What? The hooker thing only applies to the killing, and I only do that to the ladies once a year to honor that bargain. The rest of the year, they just ain't my bag. Here's the rub. I don't really give a rat's puckered pink asshole about the living forever thing. Who needs that static? No, I just, I'm just thankful that someone put the notion of killing a woman into my thick skull. Most of the time, I don't think about dames at all unless they're up on that stained silver screen. Plus, it inspired me to up my game in the whole inflicting pain on my fellow man game that I've been so fond of. Practice makes perfect and all that. Besides, who knows if that shit would still apply anyway. I hawked that amulet the next day for 200 bucks and a six or a bud. Where the fuck was I? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, my, my day. All day, every day. So I head home, take a shower, believe it or not, maybe throw in a TV dinner, catch some tube. You know what really tickles my asshole with a feather? 
grabbing a paper and seeing if anyone reports on the shit I do. Hey, what can I say? I'm kind of like a gutter narcissist. Hey, I I went to high school just like everybody else. Um, Anyway, those rags never say a peep about me or the meat I uh, tenderize. Probably never will either. Fuck them. Nighttime? Um, more of the same, really. I work two shifts a day, seven days a week, and that's dedication no one can match. And I don't even have a union or nothing. Now that's January 1st to December 30th. But that next day, that's where the shit gets serious. I take a little personal time for the most of the day, do a bump, maybe rub a few out, grab a nice steak from Sizzler for lunch, Real self-care type shit, you dig? Now, most years, I would just hang out on the fringes of Times Square looking for my mark, but as I said, this year was going to be a big one. So, after Sizzler, I got a haircut. Just gotta look good for this. I yank a magazine off the newsstand and tear out a sample of cologne. I wasn't kidding around here, folks. Believe you me, class all the way. Anyway, I get to Times Square early, and the one thing you out-of-towners watching from your big, comfy couches probably don't realize, motherfuckers line up for this thing hours and hours before anything is even going on, just standing in the cold, hard street milling around like fucking zombies or something. I kick around for a bit, taking a drag on a marb here and there. As I look around, I have to admit there are some spectacular candidates out there. Much better than the ridden hard and put away wet flotsam and jetsam of the last few years. A strawberry blonde with gigantic tits and braces that catch the now setting sun when she flashes big smiles at her friend. An equally attractive Spanish chick with the blackest hair I have ever seen. You can bet those two are on my shit list for sure. But they just ain't the one. I continue my search. I see a cute Chinese girl here, a a sexy socialite there. All big ticket scores for sure, but again, I gotta feel this one in my balls. Then it hit me. Fuck, it's cold out here. I need a coffee. And as fate, if you believe in such bullshit, would have it, there was a donut shop directly across from me. I went in, ordered a cup, and took a load off for a tick. Now, I don't believe in fate. But then again, before a few years ago, I never thought his infernal majesty would be sitting atop my boob tube pulling the old Faust gag. (laughs) So, here we are. Anyway, out of the ladies' room, she came. Looking for all the world like an angel in the flesh. Well, little angel... Tonight's the night you get your wings clipped. I watched her go up to the counter and order. The way she moved, I could tell she was athletic. But there was more. Was she a ballerina? A gymnast? Damned if I know, but she definitely took care of herself. That's for sure. Her hair was like spun gold. I liked that. It would show the blood better once I did the devil's business. Literally. (laughs) Anyway, she paid, walked out, and I followed her close. But not close enough to look obvious, dig? Yeah. So she snaked back through the crowds, the steam from her coffee trailing behind her, which was leaving a nice trail for me to follow, like that dude going through the Minotaur's maze. Damn, she was with someone. That would complicate things, but nothing I can't handle. Just have to think about how to get her away from that bozo she's with. That's when Fortune smiled upon me for the second time that night. There was that fool with his clipboard, and you know he was just on a power trip like no other. Just wandering the crowd, looking for the most photogenic folks he could find and moving them right in line with the unblinking camera eye that would beam this bullshit into homes nationwide. He'd be easy. I dealt with dudes his size every ding-dong freaking day. Hey, buddy, 
You know that big shot producer running this thing? I uh, noticed the lanyard around the hotshot's neck. Damn it. Now where did my lanyard go? I really played up looking for it, too. Oscar material here for sure. You, uh, you mean Jim? Yeah, Jim. He wants to talk to your ass pronto. Shit. Probably wants me to get him a coffee. Can't he see I'm trying to make this show special? I mean, look at the prime trim I've picked out. Uh, uh, What was your name again? Bill. I lied. First year working the show? The fool was actually buying this crap. (laughs) Yeah. Does it show? I pointed to where the lanyard should be and chuckled. Eh, you'll be fine. Now, uh, where was Jim? This way, follow me. I know a shortcut that'll take us right past this mess. The people were becoming packed in like sardines. The rube followed me like a lemming. Right into the alley where I smashed his fucking head in against the ice-covered bricks so many times the walls started to steam from the sprays of his hot blood that splashed on it again and again. I grabbed that clown's clipboard and lanyard, and I made my way back to where I saw my angel last. And there she was, just where I left her. Time to get the show on the road. Um, excuse me, miss. Uh, Yes? Pretty and shy, too. Jackpot. How would you like to come up front and watch the show? I work for the network. I pointed to the lanyard for emphasis. Oh, uh, I I don't know. Then her man actually became an accomplice in her pending murder. You have to. You'll be on TV. But can he come? Sorry. Producers want ladies only. I don't know. No sweat, doll. I'll ask somebody else. I turned to walk away, like really playing it broad. Come on, Miranda. You have to go. This is a -a once-in-a-lifetime kind of thing. You don't mind? No, we'll just meet here after the ball drops. Uh, okay. I extended my arm, and she took it with a slightly trembling hand. I led her on and on, a few twists here, a few turns there, and before you know it, we arrive at one Times Square. And that's where things started to go south, for yours cruelly. As I brought her closer, old Miranda got more and more nervous, and by the time I showed her my long hard blade, she'd bolted straight for the foyer of that famous edifice without any hesitation. Motherfucking track and field. I should have sussed that out. Too cocky, old man, I thought, as I played wolf to her scared rabbit and gave pursuit. She'd already roused the half-asleep rent-a-cop that now leaped in my path. I flashed him my badge and mumbled something about some teenager who'd mooned the network's cameras and the dumb bastard. He let me pass without any hesitation. I saw a quick flash of the rabbit as she bolted up the stairway and out of sight. Fuck that noise. I was elevator-bound. I stopped the car a few floors up. As the door slid open, I could see only the back of her shoes as she ascended even higher. It did hit me at some point that if she bothered to notice I was on the elevator and not running up those damn steps behind her that she simply had to go back down the stairs as I continued going up like a prize-winning dumbass. Oh well, here's to fear making folks make horrible decisions. My ace in the hole. The elevator hit the top floor. The door hissed open and my little bunny was nowhere to be found. Now what in the hell is this crap? I stuck my head out the elevator and whap! A kick right across the chops. Fucking karate too. This kid was full of surprises, that was for sure. Damn, she knocked me right on my ass. Slowly I stood and shook my head trying to get those damn spots and stars from swirling around in the air. That's when the breeze hit me, cold as a witch's tit and ten times as hard. The roof. The bitch had gone out onto the roof. With my wits about me once more, I bolted into the hall and immediately saw the roof access door wide open. Oh well. I wanted something to spice things up and I I guess I got my wish. That's for sure. But goddamn if those sullen-eyed whores didn't look real good right about now, let me tell you. I emerged onto the roof and immediately got stung by the biting cold. 
I need to get this shit over and get my ass home. Maybe, uh, throw a hungry man in the oven and sip a beer or ten as the late, late show on spools on WPIX. That's when I saw her. Leaning against the framework of the tower that would soon send that glittering ball that illuminated her porcelain puss skyward. I wasted no time and charged toward her like a freight train. Her eyes grew wide and she shimmied up that tower like greased lightning. Fine, if if that's what it takes, I'm game. As we made it to the top, I swear to you, the crowd below gasped in unison. What would Mr. and Mrs. America say at home? (laughs) Whatever. Screw those tamed monkeys. This year, we're going off script for the ultimate act of performance art. And this girlie's body? It's going to be my canvas. Finally, we made it to the top, and my quarry decided it was time to engage me in fisticuffs hundreds of feet above old Manhattan town. A well-landed punch here, a slice and dice there, and we were almost on equal footing until that damn ball lifted off and began heading our way. On and on we battled until that freaking ball was at our feet, and that is when I put my faith in Satan, grabbed that girl by the throat, and kicked off that tower with superhuman force. I swear to you, it seemed like we fell forever, intertwined as lovers. And let me tell you, this climax, it was going to be a gusher. And then, all went black with a moist splat as a soundtrack. I flashed uh, in and out of consciousness, but I shit you not, someone actually said it was beauty that killed the beast. Like hell it was. I threw us off that tower. Then, all went black as midnight, for what seemed like forever. Then I heard a drum, growing louder and louder. Turns out it wasn't a drum, but something a little more personal. I gasped as I woke up in the, in the city morgue. And as I swung myself off the cold steel table on which I lay, I thought, Prince of Lies, my ass. Now, where are my clothes? I gotta admit, I'm a sucker for a happy ending. (laughs) So, uh, I think that's a solid way to let 2019 head on out. Um, it's been quite a challenging year for me, if I if I might get a little personal. Um, it's been a challenging year business-wise. It's been a challenging year uh, in, in just many, many aspects. But overall, it's been a really rewarding year. And one of the things, sincerely, that has made it so rewarding is doing Weekly Spooky every week for you guys. Even when my throat is starting to give out, um, I enjoy talking with you guys and just kind of sharing this little bit of Halloween every single week, and I look forward to giving you a very fun and creepy 2020, um, as long as you guys keep on listening. And uh, if you want to go even just a little bit beyond listening, uh, we have a Patreon which you can support. Uh, We have a ton of supporters already who have kept the show alive, and I thank you so very much. Uh, You can find out that information by going to weeklyspooky.com, and we're sponsored by henflix.com, which is the web store that sells the films that I direct and produce. So um, if you were to go to henflix.com and uh, buy a couple of movies, you're keeping the the show going. So uh, I hate making it sound like a commercial, but you know, I do have some bills to pay, so if you get a chance, go to weeklyspooky.com and see if there's a way maybe you can support the show. We even have a tip jar you can uh, find at the end of every uh, episode's show notes. Um, and I do want to take a second to say thank you, Dan, for such a sick and twisted way to end this year. Uh, I couldn't have expected anything less, and friends, I know for a fact you're going to have a lot more cool stories coming from him real soon. Um, and I just want to thank all of the authors we've had so far. Um, I, I would try to name you all, but I'll forget somebody and then I'll feel really, really crappy. So, uh, 
I feel like I should say this more often than I do, but please, you know, uh, write a comment on Apple Podcasts or uh, leave a uh, review anywhere you listen to this. Or please also subscribe. Uh, Help us keep the show going. Tell a friend. Tell an enemy. Tell anybody. And uh, most importantly, know that if you have nobody to kiss uh, when the clock strikes midnight, well, I'll sit here and talk with you as long as you want. So overall, a pretty good year. I had uh, my first two television series release on Amazon Prime. I, uh, I paid my bills for another year doing what I love. And uh, I'm exploring new things I love that are uh, also becoming truly rewarding. And now I'm getting sappy, which is exactly what you'd expect from me if you've been listening this long. You know, it doesn't take a lot for me to get sappy, even on a show called Weekly Spooky. So I think it's about time. Uh, Maybe we head on out of here and leave you guys for one more week. We'll be back next Wednesday with uh, another piece of the macabre, the bizarre, the disgusting, or just the generally spooky. So for myself, for my producer, Dan Wilder, for my wonderful composer, Ray Mattis, I say, I'll talk at you later. Thank you for listening. Make sure to find your way back next week. But for now, you're safe. Trust me.